thank you very much for coming out today to this very important series of talks. I'm very happy, as always, to present with Dr. David Romo. He and I have worked together for many years. And we're going to be talking about history, white supremacy, what can we do about it. You know, I think there is both a gift to being a historian in that you can make connections over time, but there's also a tremendous burden of being a historian. So when I see a photo like the one on the right of migrants crossing our bridge, I think of the migrants 100 years ago on the left crossing this very same border particularly in the past two years, I've seen time and time again the memory of what happened before to us as a people on the border, the continuity of rhetoric, the continuity of anti-Mexican, anti-immigrant actions. There's a new book that just came out and I recommend it to all of you. It's called How We Fight White Supremacy. And it's written by two women who write for The Root. I don't know if you're familiar with The Root. It's a very uh, wonderful African-American focused website. And Akiba Solomon put it beautifully. She put it beautifully talking about fighting white supremacy, because it's not just about fighting white supremacy. It's about what we want after white supremacy. And what she wrote was, we think of freedom as a holistic project. We can't be liberated without healing from trauma, expressing anger, feeling joy, or connecting with our spirits. And in that book, they say they want everyone to see their part in fighting white supremacy, and there's no one way to do it. But I want to feel joy. I want to know what it's like for us to be able to express our brilliance, our creativity, without fear. So it's not just about fighting white supremacy. It's about what we want after that. But as a historian, I look backwards, right? So let's talk a little bit about white supremacy. Is this a symbol of white supremacy? Right, we recognize it. Is this a symbol of white supremacy? Yeah, we recognize it as such. Ever since the massacre at Walmart, I have heard the term white supremacy over and over. So I want to talk for a second about the vagueness of language. Here's our mayor. Of a white supremacist, supremacist that has no bearing or belong in El Paso. It was not done by an El Paso. No El Pasoan would ever do this. And I can't, I don't know how we deal with evil. I don't have a textbook for dealing with evil other than the Bible. <laughs> there is our conservative Republican white supremacist mayor. A wicked man went to a Walmart store where families were shopping with their loved ones. He shot and murdered 20 people and injured 26 others, including precious little children. Then, in the early hours of Sunday morning, Dayton, Ohio, another twisted monster opened fire on a crowded downtown street. So there's this rhetoric that these shootings are by monsters, they're by twisted people, they're by evil people, they're by mentally ill people. Okay, so yes, but they serve a purpose. They serve a purpose to support white supremacy. They're not lone wolves. 
And what does it mean when white supremacists are condemning white supremacy? What does that mean? I want you to, to, to think about that. Right? It's a way also to support white supremacy. Because that way we say, oh, look, it's not white supremacy because they're condemning it. While at the very same time, they are in their actions, in their policies, supporting white supremacy. So what is white supremacy? Betita Martinez is one of my heroes. She has been an activist since 1948. She's in her 90s. She wrote the groundbreaking, well, back when it came out, it was 450 years of Chicano history. Now it's 500 years of Chicano history. And she writes, white supremacy is an historically based, institutionally per perpetrated system of exploitation and oppression. And I want you to see this part, continents, nations, and peoples of color by white peoples and nations of the European continent for the purpose of maintaining <coughs> and defending a system of wealth, power, and privilege. Now sometimes we get sucked into saying, oh, that person is a racist, and we put a lot of attention on one person. Sometimes we get sucked into, I'm not a racist, right? But it, it's a system, and whether we want to support it or not, we're all in it. We're all in the system of white supremacy. And it's something that benefits individuals, but it benefits groups, benefits nations. And it's throughout our society, in our schools, from kindergarten through PhD programs, it's in all our institutions, and it's about power. Well, that's what I just said. It's about power. <laughs> <laughs> it's systemic, it's pervasive, it benefits individuals, groups, nations, and importantly, it often appears as something natural. That's just how things are. There is this concept, and it's been, well, let me back up just a little bit. There is a concept, sometimes called intergenerational trauma, sometimes called historical trauma, and that is the traumatic events have an effect on generations to come, whether the generations know of those events or not. And it expresses itself in depression, alcoholism, fear, and that study of intergenerational or historic trauma first started as psychologists were studying the children of Holocaust survivors. Often the Holocaust survivors did not tell their children what they had gone through, but the children as they grew up began to express the same emotions, fears, depression, that the generation who did experience it went through. It's been taken up by indigenous psychologists and activists to talk about contemporary life on reservations and how they are affected by historic trauma. And I think many of us see it in our own families. I think many of us see it in our own families. I'll tell you a personal story. When I was a little kid, you know how parents all have a certain way to uh, threaten you, to try to discipline you? Like, one of them was that, you know, Kukui was in the alley and I was going to go back into the alley. But the one that stuck with me and still sticks with me to this day is my mother raised me saying, if you don't behave, you're going to get deported. And when I grew up, I was like, fuck. Why is she telling me I was going to get deported? But then I thought it's historic trauma on her part because her sisters and brothers were repatriated and deported because her nephew was deported. So of course she carried that fear and imparted it onto me. And I still carry that fear. 
of being deported. So I think on the border we carry a lot of that, whether we know it or not, and I want to give you some examples. So the Walmart massacre, 22 people died. And the whole city's traumatized, right? I don't know if any of you still feel that fear. Well, you know, and I knew students who lost family. I know people who were there, but fortunately were not injured. But I was crossing Schuster two days ago and a car honked and I started to shake. So I know that I'm still carrying that fear. Well, here we have 101 years ago, two hours from El Paso in Presidio County, a massacre, the Porvenir Massacre, where there was a killing on a nearby ranch and a group of white vigilantes, Texas Rangers, possibly the military, went into the town of Porvenir grabbed 15 men and boys and shot them in cold blood. No evidence they were in any way connected. So think about how we feel now, almost a month after the massacre, and how the people in this tiny town of Porvenir, where everybody knew each other, felt when 15 men and boys in their community were shot. The families were so scared that they didn't bury them on this side of the border. They took the bodies across the border to bury them, and they stayed there until they felt safe. Men were dragged from their beds, were led away in their night clothes, where they were shot to death. So when the news came of the killing of Walmart, I went back to this. You know, and that's like I say, the gift and the burden of knowing history. Here's a photo of the KKK in El Paso in the 1920s. So the KKK came to El Paso, gained a lot of power in the 1920s, took over the school board. If you see schools that are named after the so-called heroes of the Texas Revolution, like Bowie High School, La Bowie, was named after David Bowie by the KKK. United Constitutional Patriots, who just a few months ago were carrying, as you see, automatic weapons in military gear, right up the street from us in Sunland Park, New Mexico, were basically capturing migrants crossing the border who were here to ask for asylum as is their legal right. Here's a June 17th tweet by Trump. Next week ICE will begin the process of removing the millions of illegal aliens who have illicitly found their way into the United States. I'm going to take questions later. 1953, Operation Wetback sought to deport millions of illegal aliens using the same rhetoric. Here is a recent article from Vice, activists, they think they're targeted. 20 immigration rights activists have been deported recently. Nineteen fifty-three, through Operation Wetback, activists were deported. People like Josefina Fierro de Bright, who was a leading activist in the United States. She was part of the Congreso de Pueblos Habla Española among other groups. El, El Congreso was an amazing group because they believed in human rights across borders. And they organized <coughs> everybody. 
So she's deported just as activists are being deported today. So what can we do? We have many instances of this kind of violation of human rights, of these attacks on us. I could go on and on, but I don't want to because I want to talk now about some examples of what do we do? Going back again to the early 20th century, the power of words, the power of the narrative. This is Jovita Idar. Jovita Idar was born to a well-off family in South Texas. Her father owned a newspaper. She started out as a teacher and decided she would be better off being a journalist. When a young 14-year-old was lynched, she wrote about it. Having been a teacher, she knew about the segregated schools and the inferior education that Mexican Americans were receiving. She wrote about it. And this was a great risk to herself. The uh, Texas Rangers came in to attack her and to destroy the press. But she, she was tiny, too. She's like this. She stood in the doorway, and she didn't let him in. Jovita Idar was incredibly influential because at a time when such violence was occurring, she was documenting it. Very much like Ida B. Wells, right, documenting the African-American experience of the atrocities. So you have these incredible investigative reporters a hundred years ago that are, are saying the narrative that we're criminals, the narrative that we're bandits, the narrative that we're foreigners, the narrative that we don't belong here, is not true. Here is the narrative. What if you're not educated? What if you don't know how to write? What if you don't have access to a newspaper? You have corridos. So corridos are ballads. They tell the story of the people from the people's point of view. Let me play just a little bit. Texas Rangers on an incredible chase. They couldn't catch him. They finally caught him. He became a hero of the people because he fought the Texas Rangers by escaping them. So 
El corrido de Gregorio Cortés, you still find contemporary recordings of it because it's something that resonates with people, right? So if you don't have the power of the newspaper, you have the power of music, right? La cultura cura, right? Our culture heals. Fighting together. 1903, the Japanese Mexican Labor Association forms. And you find in California, Mexican agricultural workers uniting with Japanese agricultural workers to fight for better working conditions, better pay. And it's an instance of us coming together, right? Not saying, oh, they're different from us. But what do we have in common that we can, you know, organize together to fight white supremacy? Just like in contemporary times, we have Jews against ICE who are organizing all over the country. And you've heard about the recent immigration rates in Mississippi, right? I'm going to show you part of a statement from African American activists in Mississippi. You can see all the groups down here. Listen to this. We as descendants of enslaved African people stand here today in solidarity, in determination, and in righteous outrage at the unwarranted and heavy-handed actions of the federal government. On August 7th, 2019, hundreds of ICE raids agents descended upon four cities in our state where they arrested nearly 700 workers because they believed they might be undocumented. Look at this action of solidarity. And it's not just the statement. Right? African American activists in Mississippi have worked to house the children that were left when their parents were de well, detained. You know, so how can we work together? How can we work together as people for all our rights? You know, so there's many examples of tragedy of attacks, and there's many examples of people risking everything to fight for freedom. So what can we learn from history? What do you do next? What do we do next? How do we heal from trauma? And the one that I love, how do we live in joy? When you heard my alarm, I don't know, did you hear my alarm go off right now? That's my alarm to breathe because my therapist told me I wasn't breathing anymore. So I want to live in joy and not have an alarm to me. So I'm going to stop there and turn it over to one of my favorite people in the world, Dr. David Romo. And we'll take questions at the end. Thank you.